Optimal health for high performers. This is the Health Upgrade Podcast with Dr. Nawaz Habib. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Health Upgrade Podcast. So in the last couple episodes, we spoke with regards to addiction to particular drugs and recreational drugs that have been used in addictive ways recreationally by many people and their effects on the autonomic nervous system and the immune system, how they have their effects and where it can all go wrong, sadly. We're going to shift gears in our next episode today and the next episode that comes up after this. And we're going to be speaking with regards to different types of drugs or medications, and those are called psychedelics. We're going to speak to psychedelic use with regards to its effect on the immune system, with the, with regards to its effect on the autonomic nervous system, the vagus nerve. And we have a bit of a disclaimer as we get into today's episode. And so joining me today is JP Erico as well for today's episode. So thanks for joining JP. Thank you. And uh, why don't we have you jump in and share that disclaimer for today? Yeah, I think anytime you're talking about uh, illegal substances, we have to make this disclaimer. And I think it's important, especially given the consequences. On the last episode, you know, we talked about the catastrophic tragedy that is the modern addiction problem associated with cocaine, methamphetamines, and opioids. And I think it was almost inherent in the way we presented it because we talked about damage to the brain, damage to the autonomic nervous system damage to your immune system, and, and frankly, the ongoing risk of degenerative disorders. It was sort of implicit that there was a warning. So to the extent that we didn't specifically do it, let's do it again and say, those drugs are very dangerous, should not be used, and to the extent that you can avoid them at all costs, do that. And that means even when you have a physician that's prescribing a medication that includes either methamphetamines or opioids, by and large, not, cocaine isn't prescribed that way. But um, think twice about, about whether or not you really want to subject yourself to those chemicals because they do have uh, significant effects. You know, short duration use of opioids after a surgery or a broken bone is understandable, but anything past a day or two is really very, very risky and you run the risk of, of addiction. But today we're talking about, as you said, the psychedelics, the hallucinogenics, and the dissociative medications. There are some that are legal, like ketamine, and that have been used to treat patients. But these drugs, while being clearly mind-altering, and I do mean that in terms of, you know, beyond just the street language of mind-altering, but like they literally change your brain, they don't share the same, generally the same addiction risk, but that doesn't mean that they're not dangerous, and it doesn't mean that they don't have significant social and, and personal risks associated with them. So we want to, again, say we are not in any way, shape, or form advocating the use of these drugs. That said, we also do want to say, and I think, you no, know, I do, and I think I speak for you as, as well, is to say that many of these drugs were legal prior to the 1960s and were used in research. And that research did seem to show positive potential clinical benefits independent in some cases independent of, in some cases associated with the hallucinogenic properties in things like migraine and cluster headache, in epilepsy and anxiety disorders and other central nervous system conditions. There's even some evidence that it has peripheral and anti-inflammatory effects or these drugs have the potential for that. So again, we are not advocating the use of them, but I would say that I, I am personally advocating that there be a, a larger amount of scientific study done on these chemicals. And hopefully we can find analogs that are safe and that are usable to treat some of the more risky and uh, more, more um, challenging indications that people suffer. So again, not advocating the use of them, but advocating the study of them for sure. Yeah, and I completely concur. I think we've unfortunately vilified a lot of these compounds, maybe a little bit beyond where they need to be. That said, they do have literally mind-altering effects. And that's literally what the word psychedelic means, is mind-altering or psyche-altering. And so we want to be really careful with the use of these things. And I absolutely agree. We want to advocate for the study of these tools in helping those that are suffering, because in a therapeutic sense, many of these tools can be utilized really, really positively and have been shown 
in past and previous research to have very positive effects. So the more research, the better, and the more we'll be able to act actively decide whether these are indicated in the right circumstances and, and can really make positive changes in the lives of patients who are suffering. Absolutely. So on today's episode, I think you and I talked about the fact that we've got so much material to cover that it's probably going to take two, two episodes. We're really going to focus on these two in these two episodes on four drugs. There are others, especially we did not tackle the dissociative medications like ketamine and things like that, but we're sticking with mescaline, psilocybin, ayahuasca, which is really dimethyltryptamine, which is a DMT, and LSD, a lysergic acid diethylamide. So each has an interesting history. They have different effects, although very similar on the central nervous system, at least with respect to the hallucinogenic properties. It seems to all be funneling through a single receptor, but each one has other receptors that they activate. And then we'll talk about the generally similar autonomic nervous system effects, although not, again, not exactly identical, and immune effects. And along the way, I think we'll have an opportunity to talk about the therapeutic potential for each of these. Hopefully it would be with analogs, not of, of these direct chemicals, but we'll see as science progresses. Absolutely. So in today's episode, we're going to focus our attention primarily on mescaline and psilocybin. And our next episode, we will focus on DMT, aka ayahuasca, and LSD and getting into the understanding of how they work on the body. Okay, so why don't we get started understanding kind of the principal mechanism of action here? How do these particular psychedelic drugs work on the body? Well, since they're psychedelic, we're talking about the effects that they have on the central nervous system first. And for most of these chemicals, in fact, really all of them, they bind to a neurotransmitter receptor, uh, which is a serotonin receptor. Scientists generally refer to them as 5-HT. 5-HT receptors, there's a whole slew of them. And one of them is referred to as the 2A receptor. And the 5-HT2A receptor is the primary target of hallucinogenic drugs. Now, in addition to that, you say, okay, well, that's on the surface of the neuron. It's binding to a specific receptor type. What's it doing inside the cell as a result? And this is where it goes beyond simply working on nerves. It has really a broad effect. And there's a pathway called mTOR BDNF, BDNF standing for brain-derived neurotrophic factors. And mTOR is a protein kinase. And for those people who don't know what a kinase is, a kinase is a protein that transfers an energy containing, almost like a battery pack for cells or for proteins, sorry, for proteins, a phosphate group. So what a kinase does is it'll take another protein and it will bind that protein to a phosphate group like ATP, for example. And that ATP, as I said, acts as a battery pack and it gives that protein or enzyme or catalyzer of other activities actions in the body or in the cell, the energy to undertake it. So when you modulate that pathway through the mTOR BDNF pathway, you are modulating the energy within that cell to do things. So obviously, if you have more energy, you can do things like grow new neurons, you can grow new synapses, you can regulate things that are happening in the cell more tightly. And so this mTOR pathway, when it's activated normally, it's sort of doing homeostatic and homeo and managing housekeeping tasks in the body and in, in the cell. Too much or too little of it, depending on which direction you're pushing it, can lead to problems that we've talked about before. Problems like not enough synapses or too few synapses or, or too many synapses. And we've said before that synaptic density can be related to diseases and neurodevelopmental problems like autism and schizophrenia, and then later in life, things like Alzheimer's disease. So while modulating this mTOR pathway seems like it might be a little risky, it does appear that when you combine it with the brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is a general positive influence on brain health and brain growth, you do have the ability to see these drugs that are activating this pathway. So hallucinogenic drugs that are activating the mTOR BDNF pathway have the ability to increase 
synaptic growth or increase the connectivity in certain areas of the brain, but in other areas of the brain, it turns out that it downregulates it. And that may actually be part of the reason why you're getting through this 5-HT2A receptor activity, why you end up with hallucinations. So we'll, we'll get into that in a little more depth, but that, those are really, in terms of the core hallucinogenic pathway for all of these, all of these drugs, it appears to be through the 5-HT2A receptor, and it does that by modulating the mTOR, BDNF pathway within the cell, within the neuron. Yeah, and that makes so much sense because what we're essentially doing is we're regulating and creating more synapses, essentially, and triggering synaptic connectivity and hyperconnectivity. And when it's not regulated well, we can create problems. And it, this is where we get into that homeostasis. Either hypo or hyperconnectivity are problematic in that ideal zone is where we have good brain connections that are occurring. And that's primarily modulated by our microglial cells and our macrophages elsewhere within the body. And so what we need to do is keep us ideally within that homeostatic balance of optimal function. And these will drive us potentially up if we're low and not quite down if we're high, but it will create some regulation in one direction for sure when we're using psychedelic medications. Absolutely. So why don't we dive in and talk about the first of these two that we're going to tackle today, which is mescaline. You know, it's interesting because all of these chemicals have their effects or not effects, but where they come from is natural. In the case of mescaline, we're talking about cactus. And there are a variety of different cacti that are, are found in the Southwest of the United States, into Mexico and into South America, which ha have this chemical in it, mescaline, which is uh, hallucinogenic. And it's been around for, you know, it's been around for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years, but humanoids and humans have used those, those chemicals and have figured out ways to pull them out of the cactus and, and, and ingest them for thousands of years. You know, and I should probably say some people may think of mescaline using the other name or one of the sources of it, which is peyote. Peyote is a name of a cactus that has mescaline in it. And it's, you can derive it out of, of the cactus by boiling it and and drinking the liquid or even crystallizing it after it's been pulled out of the out of the cactus. It was around for thousands of years in the Americas when the Spanish came, the Spanish conquistadors and missionaries came to South America in the late 1800s. They saw this, and actually in the 1600s, they saw the use of these chemicals and actually were sort of horrified by it. I'm sure they weren't, they called it the devil's work and they looked to suppress it, but it was maintained within the communities and continued to be used. And it was actually even legally incorporated into the United States in the 19, even as late as the 1920s in Native American churches that were planning to, or used it in their tribal ritual ceremonies, et cetera. The chemical itself was first isolated in sort of a Western scientific way in the late 1900s and 18, late 1800s in 1897. And then a couple decades later, it was actually artificially synthesized. Historically, probably the, the, the Western use of it in the late 1950s sort of led to, along with LSD and other uses, to its being banned in most, most Western countries because of its adoption by the hippies and counterculture movement that was considered sort of the enemy of the, of the rest of the culture. And so that's where it sort of got its really bad name was because it was adopted in that, in that group. But it was, a long, it was actually a, a psychiatrist who actually term, came up with the term psychedelic. His name was Humphrey Osmond. And it was kind of interesting, his role in the pathway and understanding how it worked. And he, wasn't, he was not a hippie in any way. He was a psychiatrist who was just interested in a new chemical and how it was working. Yeah, there's actually a really great episode of documentary, I believe it's on Netflix, called How to Change Your Mind with Michael Pollan. And they had a really good chance to bring up the history of mescaline and how it essentially was 
isolated and then artificially created. So this whole history, if you're really interested in it, I highly recommend checking out that episode of the documentary, How to Change Your Mind by Michael Pollan. For sure. For sure. You know, biochemically, it is like our neurotransmitters, like dopamine and norepinephrine. It's a derivative of an amino acid. It's actually derived from phenylalanine and, you know, part of the tryptocene pathway. In the cactus itself, it's actually, dopamine is actually part of the biosynthetic pathway. You can get to mescaline through dopamine or norepinephrine, but the cactus actually uses dopamine as one of the precursors that ultimately converts it into mescaline. And, you know, it's believed that the cactus uses it, you know, it's really sort of two different, two different viewpoints. One is that it uses it in its stress response signaling, the same way norepinephrine is used as a stress response neurotransmitter in, in, in the sympathetic nervous system in humans. There's also a theory that it's used as an antioxidant. It may actually even be used as a defense mechanism that causes like an illness in the animals that eat it. I mean, that's, it's sort of a poison that's in the cactus, but I'm not sure how well it works because there's actually a lot of animals that will seek it out and eat it for those, those effects. So in any event, it's a naturally occurring substance in cactus. And as we said before, the psychedelic effects appear to be through binding a serotonin to a receptor. Yeah, it's a little different there. So for those who don't know, the pathway by which we produce certain neurotransmitters for each of these neurotransmitters comes down in an amino acid pathway. And that amino acid for a couple of these neurotransmitters is phenylalanine, which over a couple step process shifts to tyrosine. And then we put a tyrosine as essentially the precursor to norepinephrine and dopamine as neurotransmitters. So it, it helps us handle stress and it helps us feel motivated and driven, which is what dopamine's effect truly is, the drive of dopaminergic kind of feelings. What's really interesting about this is that derived tool now affects the receptor for a completely different neurotransmitter, which is serotonin. So they're not entirely linked. It's almost like dopamine that's activating a serotonin receptor. It's an entirely different kind of thing, which is why it's not something that would be naturally occurring within our bodies because it's not on that same pathway or we don't have the enzymes to go down that pathway. But what's happening is this naturally occurring dopaminergic style chemical is binding to the serotonin 2A receptor, creating a serotonergic effect, which is different entirely. And that's going to create a whole different effect. So why don't we get into that effect and how the 5-HT2A receptor activation actually creates some changes? Yeah, it appears that, that binding to the 5-HT2A receptor causes a modulation in activity in different areas of the brain. And the hallucinogenic effect is the result of activation in the prefrontal cortex, but a breakdown in the connectivity to other areas. And I think this is a really great opportunity to talk about sort of the differences or similarities in some cases across creativity, which we all experience creativity. We know what that feels like, schizophrenia and hallucination. And in some cases, hallucinations are a lot closer to what schizophrenia is like but in other ways, hallucination is a little more like creativity. And so the way I like to describe to people when we talk about how, does, how do human beings, be, how are they creative? What is actually happening in the brain? There's a great parallel to a new form of artificial intelligence, which is called a generative adversarial network or a GAN. And these are the networks or the artificial intelligence structures that are responsible for some of the really neat artwork and poetry and even novel writing and music writing that are entirely written by artificial intelligent computer programs. And so what's happening in a generative adversarial network is there are really two separate portions of the program. One is that is called a generative program and it's, it's just generating crazy, not crazy, generating things, whether it be a field of pixels that's you know brand new, it's almost random, to a sequence of sentences or words put together or musical notes. So it's basically just throwing out ideas. It's throwing out ideas. The second portion of the program is the adversary. 
So that's where you get the generative adversarial network. Think of that as like the critic. So you've got the generative program that's sort of like the artist. It's throwing out ideas. It's being creative, letting the mind go. And then the second side is the critic. And the job of the critic is to evaluate the output of the artistic person, or, or in this case, the artistic portion of the program, and to evaluate it and poke holes in it. And in the case of artificial intelligence, the idea is that the critic has experience with thousands or even tens of thousands of human generated artwork or poetry or novels. And it has the ability to evaluate whether this new thing that this generative program has created looks like something that a human has created. And to the extent that it does, then it says, okay, well, I'm giving you sort of positive marks for that. And to the extent that it doesn't look like it criticizes it. And so the goal is for these programs to get better. And the generative program, you can see in, in sort of a machine learning way over and over and over again, it's trying to beat the critic. It's trying to get past that threshold of being human-like. And it doesn't really know what it's doing, but it's just continuing to create and throw out ideas until something looks like it's going to pass. And the critic is constantly trying to get better at understanding what really is and isn't human-like. Now, these things go back and forth thousands and thousands of times, even millions of times, in order to ultimately produce a piece of art or a, a, poet, a, a poem or, or something like that. The brain does exactly the same thing. The brain has, it's really kind of remarkable, that's how the brain works as well, but there's an area of the brain that's called the default mode network. That network is what is active when you're daydreaming, when you're just sitting around, nothing really focusing in your brain, your default mode network is up and running and it's creating all sorts of different random thoughts and random ideas. Then you have the critic in your brain. And the critic is something called the central executive network. And the central executive network's job is to say, no, 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 great that you're daydreaming, but we have a problem to solve. And it evaluates whether or not that creative idea has any relevance to, or does it have the ability to solve a problem that the central executive network has in its, in its mind? And it's very rules-based. It applies certain logical rules, physical laws, et cetera, to evaluate that idea. And there's a third section, a third section of your brain called the salience network that switches back and forth between the two. That's why you'll see somebody who's supposedly really focusing on solving a problem during that time they actually spend some time daydreaming. They're actually daydreaming because that's the salience network saying, no, 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 I'm gonna shut down the central executive network and I'm activating the default mode network. I'm activating you to be creative. And then you sort of get, you know, wow, you sort of daydream, your eyes go off to the side. You're like, wait a minute. And that's your central executive network going, okay, thanks default network. You just came up with a really good idea. So that's what's happening in the brain when you're creative. Now, we've talked about that in the case of schizophrenia, some of those connections that bring information from the default network over to the central executive network aren't, those are long tracks. Those are white matter tracks. They aren't functioning as well. They're not functioning properly. So there's a miscommunication between the two. And the salience network, which is sort of controlling it, is also a bit dysfunctional. So what ends up happening is, you're getting these crazy daydreaming ideas out of the default network, but your central executive network isn't functioning properly to filter out the bad ideas or the thoughts that don't mean anything. And all of a sudden, these creative ideas are intruding into your brain and into overall into your perception as if it's real, as if it's gotten through that central executive filter. And now things like hallucinations that you see or auditory hallucinations are no longer being filtered out as wrong. You're starting to sense them. You're perceiving them at, at a conscious level. And that leads to hallucina hallucinations. They're very real. They seem very real because it's literally creating a perception. The same thing is going on or a very similar thing is going on with hallucinations that are that are drug induced because the areas of the default mode network in your prefrontal cortex are being activated 
they're being driven, lots of synapses forming, lots of neurogenesis, lots of things being created to augment your ability to, that's why some people will say, oh, these drugs actually make me think more, you know, better. I get more interesting ideas. Okay, well, maybe that is actually happening, but there's still a breakdown of that connectivity over to your central executive network and crazy ideas that you're having as a result of, and I shouldn't use the word crazy, I should say creative ideas that are not real, but are still creative, are not being filtered out properly. And so as a result, you have perceptions that seem incredibly real mm -hmm. and, and relevant to your life because they are still partially filtered out for their relevance to the central executive network. And you end up with these hallucinations. Now, in the case of the drugs, they wear off and you go back to a, a more structured, appropriate function. But in the case of schizophrenia, where the connections are literally broken, they're not there anymore. They're not simply being inhibited. They're actually broken. That's why those hallucinations can persist and you lose touch with reality. You don't know what's a hallucination and what's not because it's all part of your perception. I want to draw a couple of parallels here. You mentioned kind of how the AI system is being developed with the GAN network kind of creation pathways that we've created. And those moments that happen in our brain where the creativity is on kind of excessively high mode or m more than normal. This is what happens when we're in kind of a flow state of creation or creativity. For me, it happens quite often when I'm in the shower where the ideas just start to pop up. My body, my central executive network is kind of chilled out and I'm thinking a little bit more creatively. There's different ideas that pop in. Each, each of us has kind of one of those moments where the creativity really flows within us. For some people, it's meditation. Some people, it's physical activity. For me, sometimes on a bike ride, I'll be like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, be motion's a big one. Being in the car, especially yeah. if you're alone and the radio's off, lots of ideas come through your mind when you're doing that. And I always found that running was a great, a great way to, you know, going out and running, you know, a couple miles, five miles, whatever, have the brain just sort of process through things because- there's sort of this basic rhythm and cadence that's going on. So, yeah. Absolutely. And it's linked to brain-derived neurotrophic factor that's being produced in the brain. Exercise drives BDNF production and release. Mm -hmm. And so we're effectively creating new connections biochemically driven by BDNF and that mTOR activation. Now, when we talk about adding in these potential psychedelic medications and drug uses, we're essentially activating that BDNF mTOR activation and we're inhibiting that central executive network. We're essentially shutting off the mind that says no and we're hyperactivating the mind that creates. And so we're creating and we're allowing more connections and more synapses to be physically created, allowing for hyper creativity and ideas that normally would have been chopped off the block by the central executive network. That central executive network is now going to be down-regulated. And so the creativity and the hallucination occurs way more easily in that state. Yeah. And remember, as great as that sounds, because it sounds like, wow, I'm getting more synapses. That's a good thing. Remember that neurodevelopmentally, we want lots of connectivity early on in development. We want to make certain that connections that need to be there are created. But a big part of growing up after all of those connections are made, a lot of becoming smarter, becoming more efficient, becoming more capable is actually the pruning away of those aspects of the network that aren't necessary. In the case of schizophrenia, you see an over pruning where the pruning isn't necessarily controlled and that's damaging. So you end up with hallucinations and we talked about that just, just moments ago. But in the case of having too many connections, it can be disruptive also in being able to learn because you've got a lot of extra synapses that may be still active that really should be pruned away. Now you could imagine, and I'm not saying this is what happened, but you could imagine that along the way in growing up, et cetera, there may be certain areas of synapses that would have been ideal to keep that got pruned away. And so now you take these hallucinogenic drugs and 
new connections are made that might be like those that were pruned away, then you come down off the high, the, the synaptic generation is slowed, and you go back to the normal pruning, and maybe they stay this time. And maybe as a result, there's, there's some benefit associated with that. That does appear to be part of the reason why hallucinogenic drugs may be beneficial in things like depression or in anxiety or in some of the other illnesses where, where hallucinogenic drugs were tried in the late 50s and seem to have benefit. It's also possible that they may be beneficial in like alcohol addiction. Repressive agent was used for so long that there's been a breakdown of the central nervous system. This could be a way to maybe restore some of the lost synapses simply by regrowing them. Again, very theoretical. It's one of the reasons why I think there's such a great opportunity to do to continue the scientific research into these into these chemical compounds because they may have frankly neuroregenerative properties and maybe and there's people who are looking at the potential for the use there in um, myocognitive impairment in Alzheimer's where there's been a significant macroscopic loss of brain mass is there an opportunity to use these drugs as medications to help to restore the network that's been overly pruned or broken down in an aggressively negative way. The therapeutic potential here is quite significant. And that's why we're so focused on wanting to study these further so that we can understand how they function and why they can have such a positive therapeutic benefit, which has been shown in some research and is being shown in more, more recently. But that said, we need more to be fully aware of when these drugs are indicated and when they are contraindicated, we need to make sure that we're not putting people down the wrong path. Yeah. And, you know, just maybe shifting gears back to some of the other off target effects, as we said, all of these hallucinogenic drugs appear to drive most of their hallucinogenic activity through the 5-HT2A receptor. But that doesn't mean that that's the only thing that these drugs bind to. And each one of them, mescaline, psilocybin, LSD, DMT, they all have, I won't call them off target effects because I'm not saying that they're necessarily targeting the 5-HT2A receptor, but they have other receptors that they also bind to. And mescaline is also known to have a very strong affinity, possibly even stronger than its 2A affinity to the 2C receptor. And we'll get into some of the reasons, you know, why that's important but it goes to why some of these drugs don't appear to be in any way, shape, or form addictive. Um, that even when they do, mescaline isn't one of them, but even the ones that do bind to the dopamine receptor also, they don't seem to have an addictive drive, most of them. And that appears to be because they have this additional 5-HT2C receptor activity. Now, the one other thing that I wanted to mention about the 5-HTA receptor activation in the prefrontal cortex is has to do with how your brain functions to coordinate how nerves that are passing, you know, doing calculations, if you will, like in a computer, how they time themselves. How is there that the output of one timed with the input to the next one and the output of the next one to the next one, et cetera. How do we make certain that that's moving in a very rigorous and controlled cadence? And the answer is we have a group of, of inhibitory, small local inhibitory networks that in the spinal cord, they're called central, what do you call CPGs? I'm trying to remember what the acronym stands for, but central pattern generators, that's what it is. And what they do is these and there's cortex, there's different versions. They're not CPGs, but there's something else. And what they do is they sort of create a cadence, a natural rhythm to how the brain functions. That's where brain waves come from. When you do an EEG and you see a certain oscillation of brain activity, that's due to these local inhibitory networks that are sort of giving they're almost like a timing chip in a computer, a timing clock. Psychedelic drugs can disrupt those inhibitory pattern generators, if you will. And as a result, they can break down, even within the networks that you have, break down the ability to control these ideas. So they're coming into your brain, you have no control over them because there's no cadence to them. There's no rhythm to them that you can sort of follow. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And so what we're essentially kind of noticing is when people use these, they almost have a loss of sense of time. They don't realize the time that's passed when mescaline has been utilized. Often they'll come out of it hours later and feel like it's been a few minutes or it's been a much shorter time. And that it's because that rhythm and that pattern has been affected the way that it has. Absolutely. The central nervous system has a variety of different ways of measuring time. And there's actually several different areas of the brain that measure short amounts of time. It can differentiate 15 seconds from 45 seconds. And then there's other areas that can control and, and, and tell you whether or not it's been one minute or 10 minutes. And then there's other areas that tell you whether it's been a half hour or three days. And when you disrupt those, the ability of those things to function, you have exactly what you described, which is, and that is a function of that inhibitory network being disrupted, that pattern generation being disrupted, the brain can't count basically at that point and it doesn't know. And so you have that experience of, wow, five hours have passed and I only felt like it was 10 minutes. Well, that's because a portion of your brain that knows how to track that time has been lost. It's very, it's very interesting how that functions, but I think it's probably a good time to shift and look at what are the effects, because we've been talking a lot about what's happening in the central nervous system. How do these drugs affect the peripheral nervous system? And then of course, how do they affect inflammation? Because we know from all the conversations we've had in pretty much every podcast, we talk about the relationship between the autonomic nervous system and the innate immune system and how they function together. Ficillin is very similar, as we've discussed, it's very similar to dopamine and norepinephrine. So it actually has the ability to activate the sympathetic nervous system. It's a sympathetic activator. And we know that sympathetic activation can make you very, give you anxiety, can give you stress, et cetera. That's offset by some of the mental or the central nervous system effects of the drug. But that doesn't mean it's not affecting your body in a pro-inflammatory way. And this is where we see that, that, at least in theory, when you bind to these receptors, you get an activation of inflammation. Interestingly, that appears, especially in the case of LSD, and we'll talk about LSD on the next podcast, that appears to be the case in the short term. But in a much longer term, it appears that it actually has an anti-inflammatory effect. So that's why there's papers out there suggesting that psychedelic medications might be useful as anti-inflammatories. So there's still a lot of work to be done. Obviously, it's very difficult to work with drugs like mescaline and, and psilocybin and the rest of them in a clinical setting or even in a preclinical animal model setting because they're class schedule one drugs. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they shouldn't be studied. And it would be really great if we could get a clarification on these things, because there's every reason to believe that they activate the sympathetic, active, sympathetic nervous system and that they would be pro-inflammatory. And yet there's evidence that they appear to be, at least in the longer term, anti-inflammatory. Do we have any indication as to what pathways might be affected there to create the anti-inflammatory effect? Well, inflammation is generated generally through the activation of what's called the inflammasome, which is a network of really thousands of different genes that are activated. One of the primary activators of that, the upregulation of the gene expression of in inflammation is a protein called NF-kappa B. So NF-kappa B exists in the cell, typically bound to another protein called I-kappa-kappa, -kappa, and that they or I kappa B, and they remain together, and that sort of blocks NF kappa B from doing its thing. During upregulation of inflammation, I kappa kappa comes along and breaks that connection, and you end up with NF kappa B now activated. It moves into the nucleus, it acts as a promoter of the entire inflammasome. So, yes, there's a pathway that could be activated, but it's possible that it may be blocked. So we're, we're researchers are, uh, and I'm not directly involved in this research, but, but researchers are looking to see whether or not TNF alpha levels, which is tumor necrosis factor alpha, one of the archetypal cytokines, whether it goes up or down as a result of the use of psychedelic medications or psychedelic drugs. And this um, clearly goes to why we need to study this further, because we don't truly know how it has the effect that it does, sadly, because these were listed as class ones and weren't medications or, or 
drugs that we were able to study for a very long time. So absolutely. I'm a hundred percent agreement that there should be more research done on these, but by the same token, you know, even non-schedule one drugs that are studied, you don't want to go around using them. I mean, we, I don't think most people sign up to go take a drug that that's developed at, you know, some drug company's lab before it's been fully tested or even mostly tested. People don't sign up to take them. So, you know, I would say, let's do the animal work. Let's do the in vitro work before we go running out, taking these things willy nilly to, to see whether or not they're either enjoyable or beneficial to us. Again, I know it's worth saying over and over again, we are not promoting the use of these in human beings until they are better studied. We're promoting better studying them. We're in belief that they should be studied, but not suggesting that anybody use them right now. Yeah, absolutely. Why don't we step over from mescaline to psilocybin now and understand the basic understandings of how psilocybin works, where it comes from as well. Yeah. So psilocybin is a chemical that comes out of mushrooms. I mean, I'm sure people have heard the term, you know, magic mushrooms because they have this magical, quote unquote, magical hallucinogenic effect. Psilocybin itself is actually a prodrug. And what the, the term prodrug means that when psilocybin enters your body, um, let's say you eat one of these mushrooms, the psilocybin molecule is absorbed through the, 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 tissue of your gut and it goes to your liver. The, the portal vein brings all sorts of things that get absorbed through your, your lining of your, of your gut up to the liver for processing. And, and as a first pass through the liver, there's, there's a change to, this, to the molecule and it becomes psilocin, which you know psilocybin becomes psilocin. It's slightly different mo- molecularly. That's actually the active psychoactive agent. Now, in terms of the history of psilocybin in these mushrooms, there's over 200 mushrooms that have been identified and probably thousands more that have psilocybin in it. They've been used by human beings for thousands and thousands of years, probably tens of thousands of years. There have been cave paintings that hate that use of mushrooms and hallucinogenic effects. There are, there's been found relics of shamans that were using these these chemicals in in their process uh, their procedures and their rituals and ceremonies back thousands of years so uh, again psilocybin is something that is in hundreds of different species of mushrooms it's been found on every continent probably other than antarctica and it's the hallucinogenic effects are very similar across you know, all of the different species. And it's not, again, it's just like the cactus is being, you know, being eaten by, by animals. There are animals other than humans that eat eat these things, you know, from jaguars in the rainforest to reindeer in the, in, in icy climates. In fact, it's kind of gross, but reindeer urine has actually been collected by indigenous peoples in, in areas where reindeer exist. And because the psilocin is excreted in the urine, it still has psychedelic effects. And these indigenous people will actually drink the urine of reindeer to get the psychedelic benefits. So not to do that that either. It always makes me wonder who was the first person to kind of figure that out and how they went through the process of doing so. (laughs) (laughs) Well, uh, it's a very good question. One that I have not pondered, but that person was probably also eating the mushrooms before doing that as well. You know, it's interesting because, you know, the ancient Greeks used magic mushrooms in their, in their religious ceremonies. Psilocybin was involved in religious ceremonies that the likes of Homer and Plato and Aristotle were using these drugs. You know, one could argue that that's why they're smart. In fact, there's a guy who, his name was Terence McKenna, or is Terence McKenna. He's argued that mushrooms are actually the reason for human brain development. I'm fairly certain that that's not true, but I don't know for certain, but I'm fairly certain that that's a that's an exaggeration. I wonder if it allowed for certain breakthroughs to occur and for driving beyond the the realm of our basic creativity to allow for new connections to be made potentially. You know, I could see that. I hadn't thought about that, but I certainly think it's possible that individuals who um, were sort of the leaders, you know, in prehistoric times made 
you know, who, who came up with the wheel? I don't know. Maybe the wheel was come up with a guy who, you know, popped a mushroom and, and said, hey, wait a minute, something round might roll. You know, I don't know. It's possible. But the idea that somehow brain development from, you know, from our humanoid predecessors, like Australopithecus, you know, that the growth in the size of the brain is due to, I don't see the connection there because, you know, it's, it's funny, there's actually, not to take us on a tangent too far, but I'm trying to remember his name, uh, it escapes me right now, but there's a, a guy who has made a very compelling case that the reason for the humanoid brain development, this explosive growth in size of the brain, of the skull and the neocortex over millions of years, a million and a half years or so, is really due to humanoids beginning to cook their food and that the, the amount of energy and time that it takes to extract calories from raw foods yeah. is actually quite, quite a long time and that our ancestors probably spent eight to 10 or even 12 hours a day foraging and eating simultaneously just to get the kind of calories that we can get by going through a drive through at McDonald's. But the idea of being able to sort of partially digest our food outside the body, that's effectively what we're doing when we're cooking food. We're, we're no, partially digesting it, allows us to gain the calories so much faster. And as a result of having those calories available, that it was actually our diet that changed the sizes of our brain. It was sort of like the opportunity was there and the brain took advantage of it. I just don't see myself and, and I see that being likely, but yeah, we're definitely also on a huge tangent here. So <laughs> I know, sorry about that, that, but it's a great tangent to go off on. It is. So anyway, yeah, you know, so the idea of using these, you know, the term magic mushrooms actually comes from a life magazine article from 1957, where, you know, at that point it was still being used. I mean, LSD and psilocybin and other drugs were actually sold into scientific research by the Swiss company Sandoz. In fact, they had endocybin uh, was the drug chem that they synthesized and then sold until obviously the restrictive drug laws came into place and, and stopped it. But again, psilocybin differs from mescaline. We talked about mescaline before. Again, all the hallucinogenic drugs bind to the 5-HT2A receptor, whereas mescaline bound to the 5-HT2C receptor also, Psilocybin appears to bind to the 5-HT1A receptor. Now, granted with less affinity, but it still binds to it. And the, the effect of these two receptors obviously drives the hallucinogenic effect, but the 5-HT1 receptors seem to be adding their own flavor to what that hallucinogenic experience is like. You know, unlike other agents, it, it doesn't bind, LSD will bind to the dopamine receptor psilocin or psilocybin and mescaline don't. So there's really a very little low risk of addiction. Although again, people that use the drug and experience that may find it something that they enjoy enough that even though it's not addictive per se, they do it frequently because they like the effect. But again, not addictive in the same way that you'll have withdrawal symptoms if you don't. One of those reasons why something like microdosing with mushrooms is actually something that is utilized by even people that I'm aware of personally. Yeah, it's actually legal. I mean, yeah. to a certain extent, you're absolutely right. Microdosing, which is the use of the compound in low enough doses that it does not have a hallucinogenic effect. So the binding to the 5-HT2A receptor is low enough that it's not affecting your brain's ability to function properly but it does have some positive benefits. And there are people who swear by the use of microdosing for treatment of depression, treatment of anxiety, and treatment of other problems, much the same way people use CBD. Yeah. You know, CBD is a chemical that's derived from marijuana and hemp and other similar compounds, similar plants. And it has the ability to relieve pain for some people, help them sleep better, no high associated with it. There's no THC in it but it still has that effect. The one thing that psilocybin does do is it binds to the histamine receptor, the H1 receptors, and thus it can be pro-inflammatory. But again, just like mescaline, there's not been enough study to really determine whether or not it is anti-inflammatory or, or pro-inflammatory. There's reasons to believe that if you're binding to the H1 receptor, it's going to be inflammatory. But again, there's work that shows that it isn't. Perfect. And 
Yeah, why don't we look at some of the autonomic effects here on sympathetics and parasympathetic activation? Yeah, no, that's a great, a great segue. And in fact, the segue that I would use is to say that all of these drugs, because they're binding to the serotonin receptor and other neurotransmitter receptors, and they have that sort of structure to them, they're broken down by a chemical or an enzyme in your body called, or in your brain called monamine oxidase, MAO. And I think, you know, people may be familiar with MAOIs and MAOIs are inhibitors of that enzyme and breaking those neurotransmitters down. And so when we look to the autonomic nervous system and we say, okay, how long do these drugs have their effect? What effect do they have on the sympathetic or the parasympathetic? The ability of some of these chemicals or uh, other chemicals that are taken at the same time, like alcohol or tobacco, that will block the MAO, effectively MAOIs, will affect the duration of the effect. And so again, because these drugs like psilocybin or psilocin and others have the ability to to bind to receptors and the uh, neurotransmitter receptors and then have you know their survival last longer as a result of the MAOIs it's not surprising that they would have an effect on inflammation it is really important I, we've said now both with respect to mescaline and psilocybin that the effects on the immune system are there's reasons to believe that they could be pro-inflammatory and reasons to believe they could be anti-inflammatory there is a sense to when you go into the literature and you read the literature that there are some authors who are not entirely unbiased with respect to their reporting of scientific results. You read the articles and you get the sense that they're advocating for the use of the drug as opposed to truly being sort of scientifically impartial. And you know, I'm not casting aspersions on anybody in particular. I will say, however, that there are some papers and some authors that I think have been exactly the opposite. They've actually been very, very impartial and given their scientifically honest assessment of things, not biased in any way by their personal opinions. One article that if anybody is interested in reading that I thought was a really good one came out of pharmacology review last year by a group of authors that included in Sarah D. Gregorio and Gabi. They're based actually up in your neck of the woods in, in at McGill, at least a few hundred miles closer than I am. And you know they did a really comprehensive report on all of the different, well, not all, but many of the different types of hallucinogens. And they also looked at ketamine and others. And I thought that the, the job that they did was, was very good. With respect to psilocybin, they actually report that psilocybin does increase the stress response, you know, hormone ACTH, which is, you know, and cortisol that are related to stress. And so as a result, you would think that there would be this increase in stress symptoms. However, there does appear to be this sort of yin and yang, if you will. They in the psilocybin will increase the circulating levels of these, but in the brain, because they're binding to the 5-HT2A receptor, there does appear to be this downregulation of that effect in the brain at least. And so that's why you see sort of in certain areas of the brain, this upregulation in synaptogenesis and neurogenesis, but in other areas, sort of other effects. So there appear to be really both effects taking place. There's some that are pro-inflammatory. There's some that are anti-inflammatory, some that are neurogenic and some that are anti-neurogenic and some that are pro-synaptogenic and some that are, you know, synaptolytic, if you will. And so we're, you know, we're really at the early stages of understanding how these work. And I think it's very important, maybe as we, you know, think about, you know, the next, the next drugs that we're going to be talking about on the next episode, really thinking about how it is that we can get to better understanding of the science so we can really make assessments. And that's what I think is lacking right now. And so again, not advocating anybody run out and use it and do it, uh, do an end of one study on themselves, but I am advocating for scientists to be able to do work that is unbiased and not to feel the pressure. Cause I think there's some researchers out there whose intentions are in the right place, but they're so enthusiastic about trying to push back the regulations so that they can do the research that they actually sort of lose their credibility and they become more advocates versus, you know, scientific judges. Not supposed to be the lawyers, they're supposed to be the judges, if you will. Absolutely. Impartiality is so important here. We want to truly get to the truth and not 
push in either direction, whether for or against the use of any of these things. We want to know that we can help people, period. And we need to know that we can do so safely. That's what's most important here. Uh, Really quickly, I want to ask if there's anything with regards to the science on psilocybin having different effects cortically versus in the hippocampus in different areas of the brain. Yeah, as we just were talking about, there's the effect of all of these hallucinogenic drugs on synaptogenesis. And, And it is really important to know that in areas like we talked about in the prefrontal cortex, the activation. With psilocybin, it appears to be an upregulation in the hippocampus of synaptogenesis. So you're getting more synapses formed. But in other areas like in the cortex, it's a reduction in synaptic density. But that doesn't necessarily mean that's a bad thing because remember that you know we're talking about synaptogenesis in the hippocampus. That's where learning takes place. In the cortex, that's where we're applying the learning. And to become more efficient and better processors of information, you need to have the network pruned more. Mm -hmm. So a reduction in synaptic density in the cortex isn't necessarily a bad thing. If it's too acute, it could be, and it certainly would be signs of a problem. But again, that's why we need to do more science to understand what's really going on with these drugs. And are there analogs that need to be synthesized that would be actual drugs that can avoid the effects? But I think the takeaway from this last bit, when we're talking about the immune system, that I took away from the research that I've been doing is that while some of the effects of these hallucinogenic drugs may be, we may be able to separate them from the hallucinogenic effects, much the same way CBD is separate from THC. Mm -hmm. THC is what makes you high with, you know, marijuana. CBD may have clinical benefits on pain, on blood pressure, on other things, Mm -hmm. on mood that are separate from THC. With the hallucinogenic drugs, there may be some effects that are separate from the hallucinogenic effects that maybe have medicinal value. It does appear, it does appear at just at the, at, from what, you know, what the literature sort of suggests is that in order to gain the anti-inflammatory benefits of hallucinogenic drugs, you do need to bind that 5-HT2A receptor and experience the hallucinogenic effects. The question is whether the dosing is, is the same. And that's where it goes to the micro dosing that you're talking about. It may be that you only get the hallucinogenic effects when you take you know, X amount of the drug, but you don't need that much to get the anti-inflammatory effects. You only need one one hundredth of that. And therefore, it's possible that, it, it, that micro dosing may really have the anti-inflammatory benefits, and really, frankly, maybe the cognitive saving benefits that you would get in something like a neurodegenerative disorder without having to experience the hallucinogenic aspects. But again, until we do the science, we don't know. Yeah, there have been some case studies that I've come across where microdosing on its own, it's effective in reducing anxiety and depression symptoms pretty significantly. And so I imagine it's having an anti-inflammatory effect by shifting microglial activation towards a more homeostatic function rather than hyperactivation in either of those states. So again, you get it right. We need to study this way more to really truly understand who it can help in what scenario can it help and where it should be avoided so we can make better judgment and better decisions. And I think that's a great place for us to call it an episode where we spoke today about the effects of mescaline and psilocybin and how they have their effects within the brain and within the autonomic nervous system, both whether it's creating a pro-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory effect, but how are these things working? And if you're really interested in this, I would recommend listening to our next episode where we're going to dig further into the effects of LSD and DMT or ayahuasca as our next two topics that we cover on the Health Upgrade podcast. Thanks so much for joining me, JP. Thank you for having me. And we will chat with all of you real soon. Have a great day. Sounds good.